Hey, welcome back to the Blood and Black Run Podcast. I'm Ryan from ColdSplitation.com, and I'm joined by my co-host, Martin. How's it going? Uh, uh, it's all right. We do owe an apology, though. Yeah, we do. Well, you do. Well, I guess I do. We had uh, originally said that we were going to do a double feature of Ari Aster films, and we did Midsummer in preparation for doing Bo is Afraid. Unfortunately, Bo is Afraid is not available in our area at all. Uh, it's not in, uh, I actually, I think I looked and it was like not in a 150 mile vicinity of our area or something like that. So it was just not possible for us to do it unless we wanted to watch a handicam version of it, of, you know, guy in the theater with his handheld camera, uh, having to avoid people walking up to get popcorn. So I don't think it would have been, it would have had the same effect. So next year. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I mean, so, as I say, it's also my bad because I didn't recognize that it was literally like fresh off the, into the theaters because I thought it was like, oh, it just came out. You know, I, I didn't think anything of it. I didn't even look, I didn't even look at, you know, uh, it's release date until you said, because I thought maybe it was like early in the year because you're like, oh, let's do Bo is Afraid. Because no shit, it's not going to be shown around here. We have one one movie theater. Well, I thought it was going to get more of a wider release, but I guess it's it's just not, you know, it's not coming around here. I think the closest place was like, uh, you said Ithaca. Yeah, at something like, yeah, Ithaca, somewhere around there. So it just was not, <laughs> just not going to happen for us. So unfortunately, we weren't able to do Bo is afraid, but, um, you know, we took a, a week off and we're back with the start of our new summer series, uh, for June. Uh, we're going to be at least, right in, this, at least this year. <laughs> yeah. Right in the, right in the thick of, of June. Actually, it's going to be nice and hot for us. Um, the first week of June here. So, uh, we're going to start the series known as Kai June. And I, this, this has actually been a series that I used to do back when I had a different website, Moon is Dead World. Um, I actually did a few videos, uh, for Kai June and, uh, I, yeah, I did video reviews of various Kaiju movies and I thought it would be a good time to bring that back for the podcast. It's so popular that this year at MLB's show, uh, they have Kaiju cards Mm. Uh, <clears throat> just as a series of cards. Do they like look like Kaiju? No, but it's like George Brett with like a turtle on the background buildings crashing down. <laughs> <laughs> so that's they they made it distinct. Uh they they wanted to style it that way. Yeah. So this year yeah, this year's it's weird. It's a weird idea. Well they also have this year too incognito cards, so the way they give players nicknames, so so they're like superheroes, so like they have an. I just got uh, ninety nine Mario uh, Mariano Rivera's ninety nine incognito card. So that means he's the Sandman. And so when you pull him into the game, it says the Sandman instead of his actual name because incognito. That's cool. I don't quite understand the kaiju cards though. Um, I think it's literally just because Shohei Otani. Okay. I think that's the only reason why I like to incorporate more of a you know because Shohei right now. Outside of Aaron Judge, is the best player in baseball and has been for the past couple of years. So, and it's something new to do. I mean, granted, it's not like it's not for me because I personally like cards that, like, when they put in the game that are based off of specific seasons and stuff, where you get to see, like, you know, play the uh, whatever legend or flashback card they have of current player from that year to play the stats. But the the money for them is in releasing cards that are souped up and just kind of cool. So. Gotcha. You know, I don't know if it appeals to the kids, and but I just know a lot of people, old people on the show forums are bitching about it. They're like, this is fucking stupid. What am I going to do with a fucking kaiju card of Jerry Harrison Jr.? <laughs> well, that's cool, though. Um, you know, it, it it's nice that somewhere else is going into kaiju. Um, if you don't know what kaiju is. I was just about to say, Ryan. Yeah. What is kaiju? I mean, kaiju is is actually kind of a very open ended uh, subgenre of film, um, and it's kind of blossomed into lots of different areas too. 
Uh, but mainly it started out as film and TV where you were dealing with giant monsters in some capacity. Um, and that's kind of, it's not necessarily, we, we think a lot about kaiju films as the, the traditional Japanese films, you know, the Godzilla's, the Mothra's, the uh, Rodan's, things like that. But ba kaiju. Ba 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 ba. Gamera, uh, things like that. But, you know, it, it does actually encompass a lot more than that. You can actually, you you, know, you could say that Power Rangers is a kaiju. Uh, Isn't that more of a... It it has, yeah, the tendency to also um, slip into other genres. But, like, for, for the purposes of w how you explain kaiju, there are elements of kaiju to it. Okay, man, now I'm losing, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, what the hell is we called it? I'm going to lose my weed card. <laughs> oh, of the um, actual genre that yeah, Power Rangers would be considered uh, Sentai. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I mean, yes, it is. It's Sentai as well as Kaiju. I, I like it's not Power Rangers, not traditionally known as Kaiju, but I think you can easily make a case that it does fit into that sub subgenre. But you know what, Kaiju doesn't necessarily uh mean that it's a Japanese uh film or work as well because americans uh got a lot of kaiju films in the 1950s um specifically uh in the later 1950s uh, during the nuclear uh subgenre of horror movies uh so so we're doing like, say what we're doing on them yeah like uh films like them um you know giant ants um blob. giant the blob giant um uh, there's a whole the whole list of giant animal features that you can include in the kaiju films. Night of the Lepus is another one. It's a horrible movie, but it is you know from the 1980s is a technically a kaiju film. So you can you can include a lot a lot of different types of movies into this this genre. Uh, Pacific Rim is a more recent, uh, very you know like. Americanized, but also, um, I guess, more um, faithful rendition of kaiju films. And you know what? We've been getting lots and lots of Godzilla movies uh, over the course of the past uh, few f years and the past decade. You know, we've we've had an American Godzilla film, Godzilla vs. Kong. Um, we got... Um, you know, like even King God. Kong can technically be kaiju film. I'll say, well, Godzilla 2014. Yep, yep. What there was the a hell? what the hell was that King Kong versus? Was it King Kong versus Godzilla? Yeah, it was Godzilla versus Kong. Which I never did see. I, I haven't actually kept up to date with like the newer American Godzilla films. But there was a, a recent Godzilla anime. Um, there's tons of uh, Godzilla comics that have come out. I think on um, uh, IDW they they've been doing a lot of Godzilla comics. That awful Godzilla uh, 1999 film. Yeah. Only because Matthew Broderick's in it. That fucking no talented hat. I mean, it's been, it's prominent throughout and it kind of comes in waves, you know, so we don't often see a lot of kaiju films, but then all of a sudden you might find that there's a resurfacing of Godzilla or uh, bringing up some, you know, some of the other lesser known monsters in the, the kaiju universe. Um, Criterion has uh, been releasing a lot of the Godzilla movies um, in their collections and actually that brings us to the first installment in Kaijun that we're going to do for this episode which is the original Godzilla or Gojira from 1954 oh, I thought you were from 2014 with uh, Brian Cranston no no not that one about a soldier and nobody gave a shit. <laughs> so Ford Brody, what a name! What an American name. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> so Godzilla, the original, came out in uh, 1954, and at the time, this was really the very, very, very early start of the American, you know, uh, uh, of all of the nuclear radiation type movies that were going to start coming out at that time of the you know nuclear horror and um it is a 
specifically a a uh, talking point that stems from the previous nuclear experiments with Nagasaki and Hiroshima. And so Godzilla has really come to be known as uh, one of the starting points of those discussions about nuclear war um, and nuclear uh Stuff, basically just what nuclear war can do um, when science is used for bad, basically. So Godzilla, w- would you say Godzilla for you is, like, is this the epitome of what you consider a kaiju film? Or do you think kaiju has kind of gone past where Godzilla started in 1954? I'll say yes, because um, I have very limited uh, experience with Kaiju. I've seen Godzilla before, this one. I've seen a couple other Godzillas. And I've seen, you know, a handful of, like, 1950s American uh, science fiction films that you could, like them, lump into Kaiju. But it's not... It's t- definitely not a genre that I'm well versed in because it's not anything that's ever uh, really appealed to me. Uh, the whole, you know, giant uh, monster smashing shit. It's just, it's just something that's never really appealed to me. And so, I mean, in my mind, yeah, you're like, yes, Godzilla as a character. And as a figure in culture is like the epitome for my mind and for what kaiju is, but I don't really, I have a very uh, tepid knowledge of the genre as a whole because it's not anything that's really appealed to me. Hmm. I rather watch giant robots fight. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, for, for me, like specifically, I think Godzilla was really an important film. Um, especially during its release and i think you know as we get into the episode i think we'll talk about what um lasting impacts godzilla has had on the kaiju subgenre as well as um a more realistic approach to criticism of the movie uh which we don't generally get you know especially from a 1954 movie like this uh very influential very uh deeply rooted in the culture at this point um it's hard to have a critical conversation about it because there is just so much lore behind it. So we'll try to do that when we get into this episode proper um, and talk about what makes Godzilla a kaiju film. And is it a good kaiju film? Is it a bad one? Does it um, do the things that you're looking for when you go back to watch kaiju films now um, in 2023? We'll talk about all of that as we get into the episode. But first, let's take a break. Let's talk about what beer we have on the show today. And I specifically stopped out to to get a beer. Uh, it was my turn. And I wasn't really sure what I wanted. Um, but I kind of wanted to go with the theme, go with the... Try to try to make it as close as possible to the themes of, of Godzilla. And we had just already done the Japanese rice lager previously. So... Um, that didn't really make sense. So I did find in our local beer store that we did have um, a couple of different uh, imported beers, which actually now have kind of, they're less imported and more made by American companies, and we've kind of co-opted the name. But anyway, we had Sapporo, and uh, there was also Kira and Ichiban. And with Sapporo, I could not verify the date on the bottle of when it was bottled so i really did not trust that it you know hadn't been sitting there for a year or two so it was like looking at the ark of the covenant you saw indian jones like brushing yeah, the dust off of it exactly so i i i didn't want to go with that one because i just i i did not know when that was bottled so kieran itchbron i could verify the date and it looked great it looked you know very new so i went with that one um so we got Kieran Ichbon on the show. Uh, the the premium lager that we get from um, in America, it's 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 technically the export version. It's not the traditional uh, Kieran Ichbon that uh, they get in Japan. Um, 
And I believe this is made by Anheuser-Busch. Is it really? I think it is, actually, oh, no. At least, at least oh, you mean maybe owned by? Yeah, owned by Anheuser. Yeah, oh, owned by... In them. Yes. Uh, it is brewed under Kieran's strict supervision by Anheuser-Busch in Los Angeles, California, and William Ford <laughs> Jr. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so, get it, eat your bum beer. Flash from fields and up in Yokohama. No, it's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, Are you fucking kidding me? So oh, a, it's, all, it's awful. <laughs> a very traditional Japanese beer on the show for <laughs> for this episode, of course. Yeah, um, the, most things that we get now, honestly. That, of that, course, that, okay, so this is there's an article in Google when I type in. What is the Kirin Ichiban controversy? According to the original complaint filed in October 2013, Kirin Ichiban was packaged and marketed and advertised to deceive consumers into believing they were buying a product made in Japan. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, I was not under the uh, that impression. I am actually generally suspicious of any uh, export-type beer like that where it's almost assuredly made by one of the big ones you know either InBev or you know Coors um but still I'd never had it before so I did want to try it and you know what I'm I'm glad that I did get it um while it's not you know your traditional Japanese lager I do think that this is a really tasty I think- solid beer yeah it's it's it we we both remarked on it it tastes remarkably similar to Heineken. It's like dead on. There's no difference. Like, like, ah, Heineken. It's very similar. And both are considered a pale lager. Um, and I don't know. They, they are super, super similar. Um, to me, I bet you if I took a Heineken and a Kieran Ichiban and I, I drank both at this, uh, you know, one after the other. I don't think I would really notice much of a difference. Um, I, I think I actually have a Heineken, so I could probably try it. But I, I mean, I think they're, you know, mostly the same beer. Um, Kieran Ichiban is really smooth, though. It's very tasty, uh, a little bit on the sweet side. Um, but ultimately, I think it's really good. I think it's a a really solid beer that I would recommend if you're looking for a standard, you know, straight up lager, especially if you like some of those, you know, those import styles like uh, Heineken, um, probably like, what would be another one? I mean, I guess I, I you could say maybe um, um, Stella, but it's not as no, similar it, as Stella. No, 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 no. It's nothing like Stella. Stella's got like a, really light body and it isn't that hoppy this is like just like dead on like a heineken mm. yeah i mean i i think it's really good though I, I definitely would not pass up a chance to have a kieran if someone um offered it to me i am curious now too they have kieran light too so i'm curious what a kieran light is like probably like a heineken light the light bulb Probably. I don't know. Have, have I had a Heineken Light? I don't and even... Heineken, Heineken Light is delightful. Absolutely. I wonder is if they it? have... A, do they have a Kieran Dark? Because they got a Heineken Dark. All right. It's not those things. Okay. <laughs> I don't even think they make Heineken Dark around here anymore. I think they probably phased that out. Like, okay. Yeah, they might not. Like, no one's buying this shit. <laughs> As I finish this bottle off... This is, I don't really give a shit if it's Japanese or not. This is really good. I like it a lot. Uh, and it's because it is literally like a uh, InBev, Anheuser-Busch, Heineken-like beer. Heineken's great uh, outside of their child uh, labor infractions. It is a good beer, you know. It's delightful. It's you know crisp, it's refreshing. It's light, hoppy. Got just tonight a bright, just enough bright sweetness to it. That's not just Heineken. That's this beer too. This is a great beer. 
whether it be Japanese or an American, it's great. Um, it's kind of a, a shame. A, well, it's not kind of. It's a shame that they're wrapping it up in this Japanese bastardness because it's not really Japanese beer. <laughs> and so for marketing, because again, this would be a great beer if like Budweiser was to do like Bud Craft. Mm-hmm. Get you into craft beer, like you know, and the billion different things that in Bavones now. Well, because this is like a really good in between of like a Czech Pills and a Vienna Lager. It's great. This is great, and I love it. And the fact that it's only ten ninety nine a six pack around here I means you might be picking it up again. I might be picking up more. And you know what? Maybe because that's ten ninety nine a six pack. That's how you know it's not import. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The other thing this uh, kind of reminds me of is that new fat tire blogger. Uh yep. kind of kind of similar to that too. Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's better. It's like this is like just perfectly crisp, perfectly refreshing. Yeah, it's been hot as balls. Summer's kicking up. This is refreshing. You're you're mowing the lawn and you need to quench your thirst. Bam. It would be interesting to try the traditional Kirin though that comes from Japan. See what that's like. I'm curious. All right. So now that we've offended with our Americanized, bastardized version of Kirin Ichiban, uh, let's talk about Godzilla. Listen, they can't make tacos over this or <laughs> sandwiches. So who cares? So for Godzilla from 1954. Um, yeah, I say we're going to refer to it as Godzilla Gojira. Gojira. Um, Either way, either way. I, sometimes I like to break it out just to, you know, just to say it. But Be fancy. Yeah. So, so I mean, I guess I want to start off right away by saying that the opening of Godzilla is very chaotic. It has a very, uh, it really opens up with it, a lot of things going on at once, a lot of time jumps. And I would say narratively, it is actually kind of a... Uh, kind of a mess in that it doesn't really have much of a, a storyline scope to it until probably about 35 to 40 minutes into the movie where you actually start to meet some characters that you're going to follow for a, a long portion of time. The opening of the movie is really focused around um, all of these various things that keep happening uh, on the coastlines of Japan, including you know around Tokyo and around Oda. Um, and, uh, you know, island nations that they have there, um, including a bunch of ships that just keep, you know, piloting into these waters where there's like a, you know, you, you, first of all, you're seeing there's like a fucking bubbling hot spring in the middle of the, the ocean. And then they, they, they pilot right over that and then they, you know, sink and blow up and stuff. And, I just love at the beginning of the movie, you know, we get like two or three different scenes of boats. And they're like, that boat just sank. Send out a rescue boat. And they're like, the rescue boat sank. Send out a rescue boat for that rescue boat. Hey, I, I would have actually been fine with if the movie was just like 13 or 14 different ships. Just keep doing this like fucking uh, Russian nesting dolls of ships that they keep sending out to the same spot in the, in the water. Like, I don't know. It's, they keep fucking sinking. <laughs> but uh, <clears throat> honestly, like the, the opening is pretty, uh, pretty um, chaotic because it, you know, you have this. It's right into the mix. As yeah. soon as like uh, the opening credits is done, you're right into the fray of like, oh, these boats are sinking and people are dying. What's going on? They're trying to figure it out. And there's a question of like, what is there a typhoon going on? You know, sort so something like that. Is there an, is it a natural disaster? What's happening? Because it's not clear in the early moments of this this disaster, like what's going on. So they're you know they're kind of fig- trying to figure it out, and eventually they do figure out, or they see that there's this fucking giant lizard guy skulking around, and uh, you know kind of like the the one shot of Godzilla around like the mountain is kind of like Bigfoot, right? Like that that picture of Bigfoot like in the woods, but in this case is you know it's a towering lizard monster and so immediately they're like 
It's fucking radiation. We know. Uh, because, you know, that they're taking, doing radiation tests on the island and they see like, oh, you know, everything that's been touching the coastline of where Godzilla rose, it's all radioactive. And so all, I could, all I could think of when they're sitting there prodding around with their fucking Geiger counters, just Fallout and Chernobyl, like, yeah, 3.5 rocket, not bad, not good. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, they, they, I mean, they're not really super concerned, but they're like, the rest of the island's not radioactive. I don't know. This, this section right here just seems to be radioactive. So, um, so then right there and then, like, you know, about probably 20, 30 minutes in, where you don't really have a specific, character or set of characters that you're following you've met a couple uh there's that there's one scene at the beginning where um emiko um is talking to her um her boyfriend who soon to, soon to be a fiance wants to be fiance and he's like i've got to go to work there's a boat fucking sank and she's like oh i'm kind of disappointed that but i guess work is work He's like, yeah, it is. You should go to this fucking whatever it is, the some sort of like classical concert by yourself. Why is she a heart? Let's say, why is she a heartless? Yeah, I just I like that. You know, it's it's hilarious. She's like, work is work. He's like, yeah, it fucking is. Uh, I got I got I got salvage to get. Yeah, who's who's paying for the the house? <laughs> Not you, Emiko. Um. But you don't really like that's you kind of meet them at the beginning, and then the film kind of goes away from that, like for a little while, because it's more uh, about how the politics of this plays out. Like they do get like a a sort of like um, political um, what what press conference together, and they are. It's not really a press conference because they're they don't have the press there. They actually are trying to hide this too, right? Mm-hmm. They don't. They don't want the press really to know what's going on, so they're like, uh, let's just tell them, you know, some stuff's going on. I don't know. Just Yeah, the uh meet with the local diet. Mm-hmm. That's what the Japanese house are like representatives calls the diet. And they're like, Yeah, we don't really want to tell them the truth. And then the, so you kind of get that, you know, political intrigue of like keeping it keeping the extent of the damage and, and problem from the, the public. Versus trying to go public if, and tell them. If anything, in especially 1954, they should be on the line to be like, "Hey, Truman, Eisenhower, hey, 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 we got a problem over here. Help yeah. us." <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, because it brings. I, de- I mean, it definitely from here. You, you know, you get that. You definitely get that. Um, I think there's even a mention. Uh, one woman on a train is like, "I survived Nagasaki." Yeah, and now I'm fucking here, and there's a gigantic monster on the loose. It's, um, it's what I will say is that Godzilla's themes are not very uh, implicit; they are very pronounced. The film often, specifically, kind of just lays it all out there. Um, but to be fair, and like thinking about it, if you think about it logically, this film is only. Nine years after the end of World War II. Mm-hmm. So the SDF, the Japanese Special Defense Force, was created in 1954 in like a reaction to American pol- foreign policy and on how to handle communism. Because originally the, Japan wasn't supposed to have an army. But after the Korean War, we realized, like, oh, well, maybe we sh- shouldn't leave you def- totally defenseless because we got to fight the commies. So, like, coming, and the U.S. occupation landed, like, a year or two after the fact. So, with that in mind, of it being so close to the end of the war, and not only that, like, Japan's miracle economic boom that they would have post-war, they're still away from that. So, to, to see that is, with that context, is good, because, again, it's like, Oh, to- Tokyo still is like, you know, well, I mean, outside Tokyo, it's still rural, you know, rural and very like ingrained in the tradition old ways. And then Tokyo here is kind of pre- presented as a Las Vegas like hoopla festival. So like, you know, t- to have that like still present in the minds of probably the people who are making this, like you think of like the the youth in this film 
they probably just old enough to survive the war mm-hmm. as children, but like the old the elders and adults are you know they were participating in the war. Sure. And you know, so, so you think like uh, even though that the the thieves are pretty outspoken, you think that it's you know it kind of makes sense for the time because you do have two generations of people who maybe who who lived through the war, but then the people who are growing up and pr- possibly seeing Godzilla, um, you know, as children or uh, you know youngsters who are are living with the aftermath of the war, but maybe didn't live through it, like didn't. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, they lived through it. it, but they lived through it, but they weren't old enough to like actually be like participants in mm-hmm. it. Like, you know, our, our our protagonist in this film probably would have been a teenager when the film, you know, when the World War II was wrapping up, so he yeah. wouldn't have been somebody who was probably deeply affected by fighting in the war. Probably survived, you know, fire bomb bombs, and depending on where he lived, maybe. Like the one character that you're talking about, like you know the nuclear war. But I mean, even the, even without the context of the nuclear weapons, the destruction that Godzilla reigns and with a fire burning Tokyo, you could use that as a metaphor for you know not just the nuclear weapons that were used against Japan at the end of the war, but the fire bombs that were dropped on Japan all throughout, you know, the second half of the war where, you know, the whole island is a fire because of the never ending like napalm bomb mm. bombing. Yeah. So you don't think it's too it, so it doesn't it, it doesn't take away from the impact of the film that it it just is much more explicit than maybe we are used to seeing from No, I mean, I think it's I think it's fine that it's explicit. I think the fact that it's so just fucking dry and <laughs> kind of pre- presented dull is where the where that kind the rubber meets the road on that. I'm fine. I'm fine with the over, you know, the bashing over the head type narrative for this. But I think the fact that for a good chunk of this film it is dry as shit is what hampers it. <laughs> yeah, I think it, it is kind of a problem for the movie that it doesn't have characters that you really follow until uh, almost halfway through because it, it takes a really long time for us to actually meet the characters that we're going to eventually follow you know Emiko we do meet at the beginning but it takes a while for us to actually get back into her life uh, as well as with Dr. Sarazawa who um, it's not really clear like at the beginning exactly how he's involved with everything that's going on um, it you know it takes probably I think it's about 45 to 50 minutes in before we actually really meet him and then figure out that he is working on a special uh, scientific experiment that he's like, I don't even know what it's going to do or what we're going to use it for, but I would like to save it until we actually need to use it for something that will help humanity instead of harm it. One of the, one of the dumbest things ever it takes the oxygen out of things. So how's that work in water? What is water but hydrogen and oxygen? Doesn't this man of water? Yeah, I, I think the idea of the oxygen destroyer is kind of an interesting thing because it doesn't really sound like something you would use for good ever. Like, what What was he thinking? And, how, and not like that, how does taking oxygen away from fish turn them into bones? <laughs> you know, like, like they were eaten by... I know, I, I do really... I love that one flashback scene where it goes back and there's just a, a flash and like... Every 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 fish is just stripped away, skin's gone, blasted bones. away with bones. bones. Yeah, I don't really know how that exactly works, and it does. The film doesn't really make, you know, explain it too well. But I do have to question, Doctor Sarah's out. What what good thing did you think would come from stripping <laughs> oxygen away from something? It just doesn't seem like a something you'd use for good ever. Um, uh, the sentiment, I understand, you know, that, that whole idea of we built, we, and we made nuclear weapons. It was dangerous science and then it was used for evil. That's pretty much what the oxygen destroyer is, you know, symbolic of. And that's why at the end of the movie, Dr. Sarah Zhao makes that very, uh, heroic and unnecessary, um, sacrifice to stay down in the, the water instead of come up. 
and you know to to make sure that the secret of the oxygen destroyer never gets out again um that it can't be used again for evil so it makes sense it's you know it's obviously a metaphor for nuclear weapons but at the same time you do have to question when you build a thing called oxygen destroyer do you really think it would be used for good i thought that could help us <laughs> it's, in, it's in the name alone um but the thing the thing that brings life i thought would help us but i do think going back to the characters i do think that there is an issue with you know Ishiro Honda's direction of the movie where we don't really have much of a um you know like a relationship with any of the characters to any extent the only thing that we really get is between Emiko and uh Ogata who we know that they want to get married and at one point Ogata is supposed to be at the house and he's you know he's her he's going to ask her Emiko's father that for her hand in marriage and for his uh consent to that and he comes home and he's in a pissed off mood and, and he's like i'm hands, fucking hands his briefcase off and he picks it. <laughs> yeah and he's like i'm fucking pissed because everybody wants to kill godzilla but i think that's a bad idea and i just want you know i want them to study him and how he survived radiation and ogata proceeds to just goad him on and be like no i think we should kill godzilla it's like a terrible thing to bring up to a guy who's all pissed off and coming home. Oh, he's all, but he, at the same time, though, he's also like that traditional stoic, like in defeat, like the way he's sitting in his study, you think he's about to commit seppuku. <laughs> like, so distraught by it. He's like, turn the lights off and, like, you know, ding, you know. So, like, I get it from that standpoint, but I mean, I thought it was hilarious. God, like, I would say, but God, but God damn this film, it's hard to care about any like any of the characters in it. Like they're all so just like Emiko's just like, I love my father and I love two men. And I don't know what to do. And everyone else is like, Oh, there's a dinosaur running around. Oh, what do we do? <laughs> but I just I found it really funny, like Ogata, he knows he wants to ask her father for for his consent to the marriage. And then he fucking argues to them. Just bite your tongue for the night. No, you have to prove. He's like, he's like, I wasn't very tactful. Like, no, you goddamn weren't. You goddamn weren't. It's fucking listen, listen. I'm having a hard time choosing between Ogata and Metal Gear Solid and fucking Solid Snake. Goddamn it with his with his eye patch. Stop leaving me in such a hard choice. It's true. It's true. It's a tough. It's a tough decision. I like how like uh, corny the press is constantly showing up, like flash ball, you know, bulbs flashing on the camera. It's like, what do you think you do when you fight the, you know, fight the demon monster? It's almost like a nineteen thirties press guy. It's like, what's, what's going on with you? You know, but again, it makes sense. So, like you were commenting on kind of the choppy editing, it does make sense. So when you think about it, just from the perspective, because again, we're literally less than a decade from the war. So it's not like by 1954, after, you know, nine years of post-war Japan, that they're going to be on the up and up when it comes to, uh, you know, cinema making. So the fact that, like, when you watch this, it does have a really, like, 1930s feel to it, I, I like, I'm totally fine with Like, I, it, 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 it just from like because it, it it makes sense in the context of like what you know what's going on, you know it'd be kind of it'd be kind of really wishful thinking by like you know nineteen fifty four for you know just eight eight nine years after the war to be like Toho you don't have your shit together you're not making like these grand epics what the fuck what do you think of the um all of the you know the set pieces and design and especially Godzilla you know smashing tokyo and uh you know those models what do looks you like shit <laughs> uh, it, i mean the models are actually pretty good and i think the actual work that they did on like uh destroying the models and putting them in i think actually for the most part they look really good outside of like the one scene where the fire truck gets tipped ass over tea kettle and it looks like you know a kid flipping over his toy fire truck uh 
it all looks really good except for the suit for Godzilla. Godzilla's suit is fucking ridiculous. And when they do the close ups on like Godzilla's eyes and shit, it looks absolutely fucking ridiculous <laughs> and stupid. It looks absolutely like like total garbage. But I do think the, the overall model work is pretty good. Yeah, I mean, I think they did a pretty good job with the models. The only times where you can really notice um, issues with with the the miniatures is the like the helicopters and the um, the planes. Those are really, it's really apparent at, in those <laughs> like, scenes. What? It's like a kid fl- grabbing a jet and being like, Yeah. I mean, and the other thing that I thought was really funny is when the planes are all coming in to uh, shoot missiles at Godzilla. And no, not none even, of them are no. hitting. Wow. Like, I was sitting there when that was like the jets were flying in and they're, the, the missiles, I don't know if they're supposed to be hitting Godzilla or not. But I was like counting like to fifty thousand, hundred thousand. But yeah, you know, like it's like by the end, it's like you wasted like one point five million dollars <laughs> like firing these missiles that didn't even come close to hitting the fucking. I know, I know. God, I said, they, like we could, like MacArthur sitting there, and he was like, "God damn it, there goes our jet funding program." They cocksuckers. They need to get a better flight crew because I don't know if the intention was to not hit Godzilla and like. Hit the water? I'm not really sure. Yeah, not really well, they said, well, they said after, like, oh, he got scared off, but at the same time, it's like, why not just shoot him? Well, it's not, it's not like they're trying to scare them off, you know? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and then it was kind of also confusing because the crowd is like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I would have found it like, a little bit more interesting. Like a fucking if, anime fighter. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would have found it more interesting if one of those missiles accidentally snuck into the crowd. <laughs> like, oh, whoops. <laughs> fucking bombed our own people sorry um yeah i thought that was really funny though that is literally every but, single missile i will say too stay with continuity it's pretty cool though because again like all the weaponry that they're using is american like the tanks they're rolling out are m4 m24 chaffees those are american the uh the machine guns they're using are brownings those are american so like again like it's got it's got this nice post-war chic to it. Like, again, like, all right, after the war, like, American occupation. Because it ties into the whole thing, too. Because, again, by the end of the film, it's not it's not just nuclear weapons are bad and are going to cause this. Because at that time, there's only two countries that are dabbling in this. America and the United States. I mean, so, sorry. Jesus Christ, I'm like, retard. America and the Soviet Union. So... The overarching theme at the end of this is like not only nuclear weapons are bad, but America kind of you know investing in this technology is bad. It is going to lead to you know horrible things. Mm-hmm. So I mean you know it's in you know it's it's an interesting little you know bit from the well not little but like the crux of the film like it's you know it's interesting because it, it's only nine years after the fact and so yeah yeah i mean i i I think they for the most part though they did a good job with the the model work the 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 smashing and action like you said close-ups of godzilla don't really work so well but other than that um you know especially for the time period it still looks pretty convincing um the one other thing that i noticed is the chugging of like the fire like you can tell with the fire how that's been um kind of impo- superimposed on the film but other than that everything else looks really pretty good um i think the biggest problem that i had with Godzilla though is and i you know i, I hate to say this because it kind of sounds like um it's because we don't like old movies but i do think narratively this movie is a little bit too slow, does not have enough going on in its storyline to really keep the viewer interested uh, for the the bulk of its hour and 40 minutes. Um, And so while I do think it's an important movie, a rewatch now I don't think is really as rewarding as people might expect it to be. 
And I don't know if you agree with that or not, but no, I I do because I think it's good to kind of see where obviously one of the, probably one of the, if not the longest running franchise in cinema history, where it's kind of got to start and its cultural relevance. The film does have a lot to say and goes from varying degrees of subtlety to not. Uh, it does have a good message. It does have a good, you know, metaphor behind it. But I do think that at 96 minutes, this film feels at some points everlasting. And it's just kind of like when we never reviewed it for the podcast, but when we saw the 2014 Godzilla, as good of a film as it was, as soon as they introduced, like, the people who were they, they were having as, like, uh, people participating in this film, it felt ever everlasting and went nowhere. Like, nobody is bad in this film, acting-wise. Nobody is, like, gives, like, really a poor performance. But at the end of the day, it's, like, it takes forever to get to where it's trying to go. Mm-hmm. It takes almost an hour for, you know, things to kind of pick up. And to add on with the fact that, for the most part, though, like, the yeah, action in the film's not terrible by, you know, the standards of the day, it's not really engaging or interesting or, like, going to grab you, like, and be like, so it's it it's it can be depending on your taste a taxing film to watch, and for me it is because again like having a giant monster stomp around and destroy buildings for me isn't that interesting of a premise. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean I agree with that, and I guess you know we can probably go into our review as we are basically already sharing it, but. On a scale of zero to ten, uh, choir children singing a beaut- <laughs> beautiful, m- but but uh, oh, more Christ mournful Christ song. <laughs> yeah. That scene is kind of painful too. <laughs> Just kind of goes on and on. Uh, these children singing, but anyway, on a scale of zero to ten, uh, dirges from from children. <laughs> what you give uh, Godzilla from nineteen fifty four? I'll give it a six and a half out of ten. Like, there's enough interesting things going on in the film. Um, I do think it does still to this day stand out as something to watch, worthwhile of watching, and has stuff to offer. But I do think it's a very turgid film. It's very, very just plotting, and not in a good way. Um... I think there are interesting plot elements and plot developments, but I think the fact that the film is really haphazard and how it kind of hops around from dinosaur to the science, it's it's ta- kind of taxing to watch. It's not bad. It is there is worthwhile here. There is you know there's a lot of background to it the story uh they do give you quite a bit of information to go off of for the film uh i think the model works pretty good and the guy running around the godzilla costume it works pretty well with the action that they create the costume and like especially when they get the close-ups looks fucking terrible by today's standards it, it it's an okay film. Like I, I I can't say not. I can't say I wouldn't say don't watch it. But at the same time, I can't say to watch it because again, there's nothing great. Like outside of like if you're like trying to be one of those people to come to this film with pied on eyed and like I'm gonna come with a new meaning away from it or get really ingrained in like the politics of the film. Which I do think the film, you know, with the post-war Japan history and what was going on, 
Like, it is good, and it is a good commentary, but I don't think that alone carries this film. That doesn't carry the day. Like, the politics of this film and what the film is trying to say about post-war Japan in a nuclear age, as good as that commentary is, I don't think it carries to the day at all. The film is too turgid, too just dull to really get behind that. So I'd say a six and a half. I would definitely say if you haven't seen it, definitely check it out because it's an important film to watch. But, I mean, if you don't like kaiju or you're not in Godzilla or you don't really have an inkling of that kind of thing, I'd say watch it once and move, go so you can say, I saw Godzilla once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would probably give this a 6 out of 10. I think that it's it's a fine movie, and I think specifically for its historic uh, importance, um, it surely did inspire a lot of things, and you know, of course, it it also uh, really set in motion the kaiju film in general. Um, but for me, revisiting this movie, I did not really find it to be especially entertaining. Um, I found it to be quite slow at times. Narratively, it's not super strong, especially because it takes a very long time for the movie to actually find a, a storyline. Um, Besides the fact that it's, you know, it's focusing on all of these uh, seemingly random events that eventually turn into Godzilla. Um, other than that, though, I think like the film really could have been cut down. I, I'm actually surprised that it is so long at uh, 100 minutes because generally films of this time period were about 68 to 75 minutes long. Um, in, in, uh, New York Theory exa- exactly. And I, I'm actually surprised that the movie is this long. I think that it would have been a, a a lot better suited to being, you know, around uh, an hour or so um, because I don't think it actually has that much more to offer in terms of storyline. It does go into a lot of science um, at times, and it does, you know, it does have an interesting element to it with the oxygen destroyer. Although, like, if you sit down and really think about the science behind it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, I think the idea is cool, though. Uh, it's just that it's kind of squandered on a lot of um, uh, unnecessary drawn out moments and um, occasionally too much focus on Godzilla destroying things, which takes quite a bit of uh, screen time. You know, it's 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 uh, not like we needed to see him like specifically destroy every single building. But again, uh, for the time period, I think it was, you know, it, was, it definitely it was an important movie. Uh, I just don't know that it's really worth revisiting multiple times now um, because it just doesn't hold up as well narratively. But if you haven't seen it, I I also agree with Martin. Um, you should definitely check it out. It's, a, it's an important film to at least watch one time and uh, you know see if you like it and if it inspires you to go on to watch other films in the franchise or you know other kaiju films, then that's great. Um, and it certainly did inspire a lot of other movies. I just don't feel like it does hold as much uh, value for us to rewatch now. So, uh, with that said, how are we going to continue Kaijun? We're not going to, um, we're not going to specifically do all Godzilla movies, or you know, go in order of Godzilla movies because that would be. I think a little bit too uh, taxing uh, for for everybody. Yeah, uh, choose. Yeah, uh, we're, we're going to jump around a little bit, so we're going to do, you know, well, a little variation. I was say if you're going to do that, then uh, you could do uh, just watch James Rolfe from uh, uh, Angry Video Game when he did all the Godzilla films. Yeah, you just go through that. No, I think we planned on doing um like a Gamera. Gamera, Gamera, Gamera. You got to get those women in, singing women in, of course. Robert Smith, Robert Smith, something, something, Robert Smith. So we're definitely trying to do. We're gonna do a Gamera. We're gonna try to do. Some more situated from you know the the uh 
80s uh, period of kaiju films. Uh, we want to get in uh, an American, what you consider an American kaiju film as well. <laughs> yeah, and, and you know, in, in a more uh, contemporary kaiju film. So we, it should be a lot of fun. I, ho- I hope you guys stick around. Hope you hope hope our coverage of Godzilla 1954 didn't you know turn anyone off and uh, you know immediately like wow they didn't like the original kaiju film. Uh, if you're sitting where are they around, going from here? If you're sitting around and you don't have nostalgia for the film and you sit it and you're like this is good, then you know I I think you're lying to yourself. <laughs> you're trying to be one of those people who are like. I was honestly surprised because it's, 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 it's not Citizen Kane. Right? I, yeah, I mean, I did check Letterboxd, and uh, it has a very strong rating on there. And I was very surprised because I thought more people would be uh, more um, uh, honest with themselves, but maybe not. Maybe not. Maybe it's just got too much of a legacy that it, you know. There is some sacred cow source slang, and I think Godzilla. As good of a film as it is, it's worth being like, yeah, you know what? It's got some good ideas. It's not that great, though. Mm -hmm. It's set in motion, arguably, much better movies, I think, is what I would say. So, um, so yeah, so you'll definitely want to check out more Kaiju and from us. Um, What are we doing next? uh, Probably do... um, Let's just get right into it. Let's, let's Let's do Gamera. The South Park joke's never gonna end for me now. <laughs> Just Gamura, Gamura, Sydney Potter, Sydney Potter. It's all something, Sydney Potter. I think it makes I think it makes more sense to do Gamera, um, simply because, and and not the original Gamera either. Uh, Aren't doing Gamma or the Giant Monster? Well, I mean, we could. Um, well, you, I thought you had it planned out. Now you're like, mm. no. I'm just, I'm actually, I'm just trying to gauge our, I'm trying to, you know, make sure that we're not jumping back and forth and doing the same themes throughout. Like, you know, if we do Gamma from 1965, it might, be very similar to this episode so i don't i don't want to wind up uh exactly the same as this episode where we you know we discuss like merits and non-merits of the older film um i don't know we could talk about it but i i think we're going to do a gamer film i'm just not sure which one yet (laughs) so um yeah uh so check us out um hopefully you come back for kai june Appreciate you listening to her. Look at that camera of the prey with a little child on the front. <laughs> uh, pray, praying to like, help us, Gamura. Gamera is a, fr- <laughs> Gamera is a friend to children, so. Yes, I know. So um, make sure you come back to our, our uh, Kaiju. We hope you enjoyed our episode on Godzilla. And what would Ben What would Ben Mankiewicz want us to do? I have no idea. Um... So thanks for listening. Subscribe to us on pretty much any podcasting app that you can think of. We're on Google Podcasts, Stitcher, home base on uh, Acre.fm, which is now Spotify. Uh, anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, we're on it. So, uh, you know, tune in, leave us a nice review. We're on Twitter and, fa- and Facebook at, as well. You can uh, like us, uh, do whatever you do on those social media apps, um, and that helps us get noticed as well. We have a Patreon page, patreon.com slash Blood and Black Rum Podcast, where you can donate to us. Um, we'll put that back towards beer. And you can write to us at Blood and Black Rum Podcast at gmail.com. Let us know what you like, what you don't like, uh, what movies you want us to watch, and we will consider that. So next time, tune in for a, an episode on Gamera and part, as part of our Kaijun coverage. Uh, and until then, take care.